I'm delighted you're here. And if any of you are not friends, you're all friends, but if you're not official friends, there's literature outside for you to sign up. And the Friends is a great organization at the college that supports programs like this. So um, I encourage you to join if you not, aren't already. And, and now I'd like to introduce our special guests, authors of the official national, let me make sure I get it all right, official book of the National September 11 Memorial, Allison Blaze and Liz Rasick. Allison Blaze is Chief of Staff of the National September 11 Memorial and Museum and previously worked at the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, the agency that oversaw the memorial design competition. She graduated from Cornell University and earned a master's degree from Columbia University. Lynn Rasick is a graduate of Brown University. She is a senior vice president for public affairs and communications of the National September 11 Memorial and Museum. She was deputy press secretary to Mayor Rudolph Giuliani on September 11, 2001. To quote from Mayor Bloomberg's introduction to their book, since the attack, millions of people from every corner of the globe have visited the World Trade Center site to pay their respects to those we lost. Now they arrive to experience a memorial as beautiful and inspiring as any that was ever built, which is a testament not only to the creativity of Michael Arad's and Peter Walker's design, but also to the hard work of the memorial staff. Indeed, Allison and Lynn's hard work has produced a remarkable book. It's a moving testament to the enormous loss suffered and sacrifices made that day. And it is a tribute to our country's resiliency and an inspiration for future generations. I know from visiting the memorial, their book comes as close as anything can to the firsthand experience. Presenting, uh, it, it also enriches and informs your visit. Um, and I encourage all of you, if you haven't, to go down to Lower Manhattan and see the site. It is really remarkable. And it honors a significant moment in our history, indeed an event that changed our world forever. And now please join me in welcoming our authors. Good evening. I'm Allison Blaze. Uh, so happy to be here tonight, and thank you all for braving the weather to come out. Um, I'm here with Lynn Rasick, and um, it's so exciting for us to be here. It's the first time that we've been able to talk about the book since the memorial opened, which is a different thing for us. Um, and it was such a tremendous privilege to write this book. It was really a genuine labor of love for both of us. Um, we really we tried to provide throughout a sense of the towers before 9/11. Of course, the events of the day and the aftermath, and then go through the journey of the past 10 years of deciding what to rebuild and how. Uh, it was important to us to convey the magnitude, not just of the project itself, but of the process behind it. And that included not just the inspirations and the successes, but also the wide-ranging opinions, the debates and the setbacks, uh, and the vast array of people who are all so intimately connected to each decision made, large and small. Uh, all of that contributed to the final product of something that will now endure for generations to come. So some of you I know may have already read the book, and uh, Lynn and I thought we would share some of the stories that made writing it the most personal to us, um, and a few of the details that did not make it to print. Uh, since the book was published last summer, before the dedication of the memorial on the 10th anniversary, this is also a welcome chance for us to show you some of the amazing recent photos and look back on what a place of remembrance means now that more than a million people have already visited the memorial. And I can't tell you how much that number means to us, to hear that over a million people have come already. And those are all people who were not able to set foot on the World Trade Center site for 10 years, who've now come to the sacred site and taken part in our core mission to remember the nearly 3,000 victims of the attacks. And in honoring them, anyone who visits can't help but recognize that the names that they're seeing are the everyday mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, and husbands and wives who make up the fabric of this country, who did on that day what so many of us do every day. They just got up in the morning and went to work. More than 400 of them were first responders who died performing their sworn duties, rushing into rather than out of harm's way. They came from over 90 different countries. The oldest was 85 years old, and the youngest was only two and a half. 
All of their stories are important, and only a subset fit within the pages of this book. But through the museum that we're now creating, we're striving to meet the second part of our mission, which is to educate the millions of people who visit each year, not just by telling the story of what happened on 9-11, but by recognizing that the events of that day are part of an ongoing story, one that, as events like the 9-11 health bill and Osama bin Laden's death show us, has not yet ended. Before we get to the present day, though, I want to step back to how we got to the mission that we're now working to achieve. In the aftermath of the attacks, the instinct to memorialize was, of course, spontaneous worldwide. Children from around the world sent cards and drawings to recovery workers. Within a day, Union Square was lined with candles, photographs, letters, poems, and drawings. So many channeled their emotions and reactions into creating something, whether they were professional artists or families around the kitchen table, just struggling to make sense of what had happened. Up top here, you see Betty Nielsen, who decided to organize her community in Fonda, Iowa, to create quilts for the families who lost loved ones. On the bottom is a banner that's now in our museum collection, created and sent to New York by students from Charleston, South Carolina. And on the top right is a familiar image of a stunning memorial that's now become an icon of how our nation remembers 9-11, the tribute in light that still graces the New York skyline every anniversary of the attacks. Memorial scholar Ed Linenthal has said that the act of memorializing victims is a protest, a way of saying we will not let these dead become faceless and forgotten. The sketch you see here was someone else's artistic response, someone else's way of remembering. This is memorial architect Michael Arad's first imagining of how we could remember those who were killed. He made this sketch before any plans for the World Trade Center had ever been announced. The twin voids representing the towers that you see here remain in the design we've realized today, but in this initial sketch, they were actually envisioned as cut into the Hudson River. Michael created a model of what this might look like on the roof of his apartment building. This idea, while beautiful, was ultimately impractical to realize, but it served as the basis of Michael's submission to the formal design competition in 2004. Michael's design, entitled Reflecting Absence, was selected from more than 5,000 submissions received from 63 different countries. It was the largest design competition in history. All but the final rounds of the international competition were judged, by, were judged blind by a jury that included a widow of a 9-11 victim, prominent architects, artists, and other cultural leaders, including Maya Lin, who was of course the winner of a similar competition in 19, 1981 for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Michael was at the time a 34-year-old unknown architect working for the New York City Housing Authority. His design struck a chord with the jury from the start, but they noted that it felt too cold and needed something to soften and warm it, something that would bring new life back to the site. 